On behalf of Extral, I'd just like to welcome you. My name is Christy Amobi, and I work in the product division at Extral. Uh, we put together today's panel to have some leading um, radiation oncology researchers come together, radiation researchers come together to talk about advancements in translational radiation uh, research. And um, Extral really wanted to put together this panel in recognition of the fact that SARP, um, our translational research unit, has been out in the field 10 years now, and these are some of the earliest SARP researchers. So we're delighted today to be able to provide a short introduction um, from Dr. John Wong from Johns Hopkins University and also welcome Dr. Frank Vehagen as the moderator for today's event. With no further ado, I'd like to turn it over to John Wong, who is going to provide a short introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Thank you. So hello, everybody. Uh, it is not my intention to come across as mysterious. It just turns out that I have a uh, I had my eye surgery move one day ahead, so I'm very happy to be here. So uh, it is really quite amazing to see all of you here and to see how well the SARP has been uh, embraced by the community. Well, looking back, uh, I can tell you, we can talk about many, many funny stories to all these folks here uh, how, of how we built the SARP. Uh, but we'll wait for another time, maybe 20 years from now over a beer or something when we do face to face, maybe not that long. But the SARP began in actually 2004 when we moved it from William Boma to, to Hopkins. Uh, some of you might know that we were actually working with the X-ray focusing lens, okay, trying to deliver one millimeter, one millimeter beam. Uh, but X-ray came along and showed us that it was quite an overkill. Uh, Frank Verhagen was actually very, right at the beginning, was working with us and, and worked true implanting requirements. So those are fun days. Um, but the most important ground zero to me was when I ran into Amanda Tok, actually by chance at Astro 2009. And she she jumped around very bubbly, went on to talk Martin Robinson, the late Martin Robinson, uh, to take on the system uh, as Skalme, and now extra. Uh, there were certainly some shaky starts about how to shift system around, uh, but I am very thankful for all the early adapters here uh, to be speaking. Uh, uh, to me, these are amazing people and they're actually working on the bleeding edge. Uh, and I want to also congratulate Extra and Adrian Traverton in, in playing that major role in disseminating this system. I don't think it can happen without the industrial partner like that. And I understand there's now close to 100 systems worldwide. So for me, this is very rewarding and exciting to see the SOP uh, actually a catalyst now for so many multidisciplinary applications and collaboration. Uh, much further, much for, uh, more than what Hopkins can do alone. So I welcome you all to this meeting to celebrate the uh, extra 10th anniversary of the SOP. Uh, thank for you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wong. I'd just like to now turn it over to Dr. Rehagen to make short introductions. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. So it's a real pleasure to uh, be the moderator on, on this session, all the more so because I feel just a little bit like an intruder because um, I have to confess that we are actually not a SARP site and that we actually use uh, let's say, other uh, technology. Uh, but we do work quite closely with uh, SARP on developing, for example, new planning systems. So hopefully that can also be discussed later on. But let me introduce you now to the panel members. So first of all, we will have uh, Ross Berbico speaking. He's a medical physicist from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Um, these little numbers you see uh, at the end there, that means uh, the order in which they purchased the system. So, you see that there are some real pioneers here. Second system in the world was bought by Ross, uh, apparently. Uh, second speaker will then be Kostas Koumenis. Um, um, he's a biologist from the University of uh, Pennsylvania. Then uh, George Wilson. He's also a biologist from uh, William Beaumont. Anthony Chalmers then from, uh, from Europe, University of Glasgow, oncologist. And Shandan Gruer from 
uh, Montefiore Medical Center, also radiation oncologist. And then finally, uh, Carl Butterworth from Belfast, uh, also a biologist. So um, uh, after that, we will have, uh, or in between actually the, the speakers, we will have already some uh, Q&A. And then at the end, we will have a debate uh, for you. So first, I would like to ask now uh, Dr. Berdigo to take uh, the floor. Hi, thank you, everybody. Hey, this is awesome. Rebecca coming to you from sunny Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, thank you, Frank, for the introduction and Kirsty for the invitation to speak today. And congratulations uh, to John Wong for uh, for putting you know this device into play, and and you can see. Uh, uh, what you've done, <laughs> uh, the, the amazing research that uh, has been inspired. So as was mentioned, uh, Dana Farber, uh, we were we received the second uh, SARP that was uh, delivered. So that was back in uh, 2010, uh, a little bit more than 10 years ago, actually, from today. And uh, I'll be telling you a little bit about our experience and some of the research that we've done over the last 10 years. So when the SARP arrived, you can see in this picture here on the left, um, it was raining, which is why the picture isn't so good. And as the SARP was being driven up from Georgia, the truck broke down. So uh, the guys had to rent a motorcycle trailer. You can see maybe there's a Harley Davidson symbol on the side of this trailer. And that's, so they drove it up the rest of the way. They left the truck and drove up the SARP in this trailer the rest of the way from Georgia to Boston and uh, delivered it to us. And this is what it looked like back then, uh, kind of like a physics experiment. And you can see that we've put on some uh, of our own lead shielding uh, to, to cover it up. And this is on the right what it looks like, or what it looked like uh, when we first implemented it with our own lead shielding and, and lead uh, glass attached to it. So we treated our first mouse uh, 10 years ago next week. And uh, you can see this is, a this is a radiation oncologist and the current chair of radiation oncology at NYU, Dr. Alec Kimmelman. Uh, this is the only time we let him push any buttons on the SARP. And uh, doing a little photo shoot here for our first, our first mouse irradiation. Early on, we did a lot of work on uh, quality assurance, uh, creating new quality assurance uh, uh, protocols and procedures and ideas and, and um, equipment. Uh, here you can see a collection of, of MOSFETs embedded in a solid water, those kind of mouse sized. Um, we've been doing uh, regular quality assurance, trying to mimic what we do in the clinic. Uh, we also participated in Monte Carlo modeling of the SARP and uh, helped uh, with some of the um, treatment planning advances that have been done uh, over the years. Interesting, one of those early studies was this one here where we looked at, I wanted to, to measure the actual in vivo dose uh, being delivered to mice. And so we implanted MOSFET detectors in euthanized mice uh, in several of the uh, anatom anatomical sites and then um, did our treatment plans and, and measured uh, the dose and found very low discrepancies across several disease sites and mice. Another early study uh, was um, something that couldn't have been done on any other type of system, uh, delivering conformal radiation therapy to uh, these GEM, so genetically engineered mouse models of uh, pancreatic cancer. And because you can't see them very easily, um, the investigators uh, used ultrasound imaging ahead of time to determine where the tumors were and the size of them. And then we put the, the mice on the SARP and we use that imaging for our treatment planning uh, to deliver therapy. Oops. Uh, this is a study, uh, another 
uh, interesting mouse model uh, by uh, uh, Kwok Wong and his group. He's now the chair of medical oncology at NYU. Uh, looking at uh, single nodule uh, conditional lung cancer mouse models uh, and delivering conformal therapy specifically uh, to those nodules. Again, something that was not previously, uh, could not have been done previously. Uh, my own lab has done some work looking at nanoparticles, targeted nanoparticles uh, with radiation, combined with radiation for tumor vascular modulation. That was work that was done on the SARP. We've also done some interesting studies uh, using SARP adjacent technologies. So this is a device by a company called Sonoval um, in which uses the SARP platform. You can transfer the SARP platform directly from the SARP to this ultrasound device. So the mice are in the same position and then you can uh, perform, let's see if this is working. You can perform um, advanced uh, ultrasound procedures like uh, acoustic angiography on the mice to evaluate the vasculature and tumor physiology. Here you can see in this study, we were looking at uh, that nanoparticle mediated vascular modulation and uh, studying uh, the impact after radiation therapy. A very recent study, I was looking at uh, circulating tumor cells uh, again, with a SARP adjacent technology, uh, this uh, diffuse in vivo flow cytometry DIFC technology developed by Mark Nidra at Northeastern University. Again, using the SARP now uh, to deliver radiation specifically to a primary tumor and then measuring uh, circulating tumor cell clusters in vivo uh, on their way to uh, perhaps generating metastases. Uh, my colleague, colleague, Dr. Will Ingwa, has been studying uh, the upscopal effect, and uh, which is uh, something that's been uh, found recently in patients where treatment at one site of disease can impact uh, uh, another side of disease far away from that initial primary. And so he's doing this in mouse models where he's got uh, multiple tumors in the mice and radiating one of them and seeing the impact on other, uh, on other sites of disease. And that's again being done on the SARP. Here's another study by uh, Dr. Ngwa, and you can see a picture of him here in the upper right. This is from our early days with SARP, uh, Will was a postdoc back then. Now he's a, a very productive member of our faculty. And in this study, uh, he was looking at uh, the impact of using different collimator sizes. So, uh, you know, just studying this idea that maybe you don't have to treat the entire tumor to have an epscopal effect uh, on other sites of disease far away from the primary. So again, a very interesting study that, to be done on the SARP. So overall, this is a partial list of, of the many SARP-related publications that have come out of our institution. Uh, there are many more um, uh, that could be added to this and many in progress currently. And our uh, you know, we've used this platform to do great science and to attract funding to do even more science. And so this has really been a catalyst uh, for our department um, and for, for science at our institution um, in radiation therapy, and uh, hopefully will continue to be so for many years to come. So. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Berbico. That's uh, quite an impressive overview. Um, Christy, I don't, I don't see any questions just yet. Is that correct? Correct, yeah. Um, Ross, I, I was wondering, the ultrasound imaging work that you did, 
I think that that only works on uh, hairless mice, right? Because as soon as they have a bit of hair, that would be very difficult. Eh? Is that correct? It becomes challenging. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, and in your experience, are these images good enough to to use for, for example, treatment planning? Can you see the organs clearly? Um, so okay. So on the on the uh, those initial studies, I uh, uh, were those hairless mice. I don't recall. Um, as but as far as to be used for treatment planning, yes, uh, yes. So we use these images. Um, the uh, the investigators, you know, use the tools on the ultrasound to measure uh, the, the dimensions of the tumor itself, and then um, placed a fiducial on top of it to mark where the spot was, and then when the mouse is brought over to the SARP, we set up based on where that fiducial was, and then off that we knew exactly where the tumor was and, and the size. Um, and and at that time we uh, pre you know prescribed dose to the center of the of the tumor and then we could see uh, where um, and what the dose distribution was and uh, did some early studies on histopathology to confirm to confirm that. Okay, was, was that ever integrated with uh, your treatment planning system? Could you really upload uh, ultrasound images and then uh, contour and stuff? Yep. So, so we never tried. We never tried to do that. Um, and you know, maybe other SARP users could uh, comment on that. I've never tried um, the multi-modality uh, image registration, which I believe is part of the system, but we've just never done it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so also uh, your list of publications at, at the end, I uh, would like to congratulate Extra because they have a very clear part of their uh, website is devoted to, to a very long list of publications. And since these papers are scattered all over the literature in many, many different journals, it's actually very nice that uh, there is one uh, resource for this. Um, Ross, the question is the, unifo the unifocal lung nodule irradiation was done by respiratory gated micro CT. That's the question. No, uh, no, that so the images I showed, uh, uh, the top row was uh, MRI images. Uh, I don't know if it was gated, I don't believe so. And then the other CT images were SARP uh, images, uh, those are not micro CT images, and was not gated. We did mm -hmm. not have that capability at that time. And uh, something that I haven't seen much about in the literature is how do you determine your margins, for example, for, uh, for radiation? Because in, in human radiotherapy, there's lots of recipes for that, eh? but in animals, I've not seen much work in that field. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure. And I think, uh, you know, there are a lot of questions around, um, you know, for a lot of these mouse studies, uh, yeah, I think I think we tend to be generous on the margins uh, because unless you're specifically studying adjacent normal tissue toxicities, uh, you really just want to make sure that you're covering the tumor as much as possible, and then uh, you know doing a at least a a, a very bulk um, uh, job at at sparing the, the healthy tissues. Uh, mm -hmm. Unless you're you know very specifically. Uh, you know, studying lung pneumonitis um, in like the orthotopic lung cancer model or something, uh, then I would, I would, my recommendation would be is be generous on the margins. Uh, yeah, I guess long-term survival of the mice is not really a primary aim eh, in these studies. Yeah, and and if but if it is, you know, then that's something that 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 definitely has to be has to be included. But for, for the things, a lot of things we're doing, it's it's not. Yeah, all right. So, Christy, I don't see any more questions. So then I think we can move on to the second speaker. Second speaker, Kostas Kumenis from the University of Pennsylvania. Right. Hi, everybody. Can you see my screen? Yes. Great. So uh, thanks, Christy, and the rest of the extra team for uh, inviting me to share our experience uh, with uh, the SARP over the last 10 years, as you heard earlier, we're one of the early adopters. I'm sorry, because something is popping up here. Um, 
Okay. So, um, so, and, and also want to congratulate John uh, and, and Adrian for uh, really developing and commercializing the system, which uh, I really uh, think that um, uh, has uh, had a huge impact. It revolutionized, um, uh, you know, animal radiation research. At least for us, it has. Um, so, uh, in terms of um, the history of the SARP at Penn, I'm going to give a very brief overview of the of some of the milestones. We acquired the SARP uh, with a uh, S10 NIH grant back in 2011. Uh, as you heard, it was SARP number four. And um, uh, four years later, we moved to a new building and uh, where actually our clinic is. And we had the opportunity to actually install the SARP, as you can see here on the left, um, you know, without any shielding in a vault, because this is a research vault that is at the end of our proton bin. And thereby we created, we believe, one of the first situations where we have a, both a photon and proton SARP. You see there's two beams, beam outlets here. Uh, the, the beam comes out of the wall here, and we actually use the SARP to image and position the mice. And when we uh, are not using protons, uh, we actually, uh, together with Extra, we had the idea of, of moving, putting rails on the SARP so we can move it out of the beam uh, path and actually be able to perform uh, very detailed, uh, you know, positioning and analysis of the of the of the mice. You see here the entry to the vault on the right, um, where we do the animal prep, and also everything is done and monitored remotely. That you see here from this workstation, including anesthesia, we had to develop everything from scratch. Uh, another major development was then um, in um, in 2019 we had the uh, acquisition of a second SARP. This is, I believe, either the third or fourth generation of the SARP, which uh, has uh, is self shielded, as you can see here on the right, um, and uh, also allowed us to put it in the in the uh, research room. And this was uh, thanks to a donation by the uh, Mark Foundation uh, for Biomedical Research uh, to Dr. Andy Min. And uh, the next milestone was the um, uh, initiation of flash uh, studies. Um, they have flash, I think everybody in this audience is familiar with the uh, new modality of flash. I'll, I'll refer to it a little bit later, where uh, you spare uh, mostly normal tissue, uh, and the uh, ability to perform proton radiation was key here. And I'll also very briefly uh, mention the collaboration that John uh, initiated with Penn uh, to actually uh, uh, start uh, developing potentially in the future a, uh, a SARP for, for flash research. So Roth mentioned some of their publications in their group, and, and this is not an exhaustive list uh, uh, by any means. So we have 52 publications. So we, we also have been productive in see some in really high impact journals that mentioned the use of the SARP um, and also some of the key journals in our, in our field. Um, more importantly for translational research, uh, work on SARP has actually supported the initiation of four human trials. Three of them deal with the uh, in, impact of uh, radiation in the immune system and vice versa. We actually also started one um, trial in, in canines with flash uh, uh, radiotherapy, not using the SARP, but the mouse data that actually led to that. And that's important for bringing flash into the clinic. Uh, like the Harvard group, uh, work with uh, uh, the SARP, uh, both SARPs has supported a number of NIH grants you can see here, and additional other grants such as the Mark Foundation, and our total funding direct costs over $70 million, which, you know, it doesn't mean that this, without the SARP we wouldn't um, be successful, but perhaps uh, not as much uh, as this. So you see the return on investment is pretty substantial. Because, because of our experience in the large number of users we have a pen, you see here 45 users from seven departments, um, the, uh, the whole uh, SARP um, facility has now been proposed and approved by the cancer center as a new uh, shared uh, cancer center core. So in the next few slides, I'm going to present some uh, some uh, vignettes, if you like, for what what is really unique about the SARP and what doors it can open in terms of translational research. Um, back in 2015, uh, a, a very talented postdoc, postdoc in my lab, Yanis Verginadis, I took on a project to develop a more physiologically relevant model of intestinal uh, radiotherapy. Up to that point, there were very uh, interesting and useful models but most of them involved uh, irrigation of the whole abdomen or exterior, ex exteriorization of the of a portion of the intestine that led to a lot of issues such as uh, 
you know, infection and the, the, the mice would die. So we wanted to develop a more physiologically relevant model, and this we achieved by the implantation of a radio path marker, as you see here, uh, during survival surgery. And these images are actually obtained by the onboard comb beam CT uh, of, the, of the first generation survey, how clear um, and useful they are. And using this approach, we uh, started irradiating um, uh, at the uh, radio path marker that we can image it using image guided uh, radiation uh, capability of the SAR. And we trace where we actually hit uh, the target by performing gamma H2X immunofluorescence, as you can see here. And you can see that the damage extends a little bit beyond the uh, circle, uh, but it falls off pretty rapidly after that. You can do studies such as a dose response, for example, where you see the the peak of the damage at one hour and by six hours with double star break repair, DNA repair is primarily completed, and 24 hours later there's no uh, signal. Uh, but another application of this is actually you can now track what happens at the area of radiation or adjacent to it. So from another study uh, led by a very talented undergraduate student uh, uh, who is now at the um, Montefiore with, with Chandan Guha, uh, he radiated uh, the same portion, half a centimeter of the intestine, and I don't need to tell you, you can actually see where the beam hit. And then uh, uh, Brett uh, asked the question, what happens to the surrounding area in terms of proliferation? And what he found was really remarkable that, as you can uh, appreciate here, there's hyperproliferation in the, in the non-irradiated areas. And we suspect that these are the proliferating cells that then slowly will move into this uh, damage area and restore um, restore the, the crypts and the villi in the, the radiated damage area. You can also perform uh, experiments, long-term experiments, as, as the experiment we did here, where we induce fibrosis, uh, and this is actually eight to 10 weeks following radiotherapy. And if you notice the dose here, it's 18 gray, which uh, all of you know will kill animals if you do a whole abdomen radiation. So instead of doing a whole abdomen and waiting for uh, months for fibrosis to, <clears throat> to develop, you can actually deliver really high doses if you do it focally. And this was a major finding of our paper. Um, but then you can actually study the, the fibrosis that you see here, complete loss of arch architecture, and you see the fibrosis stained uh, with trichrome. And, and also you can test uh, the ability of certain um, radiation modifiers to protect uh, that tissue, as you see here with one of our um, favorite compounds that we were studying at the time. Using a very similar approach, um, a, a talented uh, medical student, uh, Alexi Dreyfus, who is now doing a, a, a residency at Memorial in Radiation Oncology, uh, decided to, to develop a, also a more physiologically relevant model of heart damage. Uh, when you study normal tissue, uh, and, and especially, uh, specifically heart damage, uh, established models were either irradiating the whole heart, or if they did partial heart radiation, they would irradiate the whole thorax, <coughs> which also involved significant portion of the lung. So in two different modes, and you can see here the treatment planning from the MURI plan that's available for the SAR. Um, in one series of experiments, um, Alexi irradiated only the heart and avoided primarily the lung. As you can see here, there's no significant damage. Uh, it's uh, analyzed by gamma H3X. Or she developed a model where you irradiate both the heart and the lung. And, and again, you see here the, the uh, damage induced uh, in this area, which is analyzed one hour following radiation. And this is important because we re now recognize that incidental uh, deposition of radiation to the heart in, in patients such as with lung cancer or breast cancer can lead to significant cardiovascular defects, uh, you know, uh, months or, or even years uh, following radiotherapy. And following this, um, this um, uh, model, uh, we actually could uh, surprisingly give very, very high doses, single doses up to 60 gray, um, where uh, the mice are surviving and doing fine, but eventually they develop fibrosis again two or three months into following radiotherapy. And how can we give 60 gray uh, to the heart? Uh, we have to avoid the lungs, of course. You can do this by using arc therapy. You can see here the, the uh, discoloration of the, of the uh, fur of the mouse by doing arc therapy with the SAR. And as you can see here on the right, um, uh, we measure different um, uh, parameters of cardiac function, uh, such as left ventricular e e ejection fraction or the E over e, e prime, you can see that we see those response uh, changes in these uh, in these functions, uh, indicating that there is um, uh, uh, problems in the, in the function of the heart. And interestingly, the fibrosis that we observe is not spread out 
It's primarily localized to the RNA that you see here in the, in the bottom left function of the heart, uh, but it's also localized, appears to be localized around existing blood vessels. And since we're doing translational work, uh, we wanted to um, identify biomarkers of exposure of the heart to, uh, to radiation. And uh, using our mouse model, we identified a, uh, a cytokine called uh, PLGF, placental growth factor, that uh, was significantly upregulated uh, in the heart tissue uh, two and four weeks um, uh, following uh, radiotherapy. And again, we see a dose response here. And then we went into a uh, biobank of human patient uh, blood that we have. We isolate this from patients before and following radiotherapy, uh, before, during, and following radiotherapy. And we identified um, PLGF as one of the markers that showed a significant increase uh, following radiation therapy. And interestingly, other biomarkers that are associated with heart damage, such as troponin T, didn't show uh, the same correlation. And, and this manuscript right now is uh, under revision. Uh, in the uh, third uh, and final example, I'm going to um, briefly touch upon our studies with flash proton therapy. Uh, I, again, I, I believe most of you are familiar with this new and exciting uh, uh, field where uh, it's defined as delivery of ions and radiation, either electron or proton at this point, uh, delivered um, at ultra high dose ra rates over 80 grade per second or 100 grade per second for some uh, studies. Um, and the reason it's exciting is because it appears to be less toxic to normal tissues, while at the same time it's as effective or persons that is more effective as standard radiation therapy. And of course, if it's more broadly validated, it will revolutionize radiation therapy. We could deliver higher doses, uh, say, to tumors or establish doses um, with reduced toxicity to critical organs. You see here a number of publications following the landmark study by the Fabadon and Bosanin group in science relational medicine 2015 including a, the first paper on proton therapy by our group and a follow-up study by uh, a Harvard group using uh, proton flash. And very briefly, uh, an, an example of this is when we place the mouse in the SARP and we deliver proton therapy. Um, and you can see here, uh, again, in a focal way, we uh, can induce fibrosis, but this is significantly ameliorated if we deliver this dose in a flash mode. And we have, can quantify this by based on the thickness of the uh, muscle layer, uh, and um, the SARP and the positioning of the tumor gives us the ability to radiate both the tumor um, and the normal tissue with our proton beam. And you can see that there is no difference here in tumor control. So um, about two months ago, three months ago, uh, John approached me. Uh, we had collaborated with John before in developing optical imaging for the SARP. And, um, you know, he, he saw our studies and decided to, co uh, to collaborate with us as a testing site for his new idea to develop a, an X-ray flash system. As you can see here, it's gonna be a cabinet uh, model. Uh, it has to be able to deliver, uh, to have high ca current capacity of 100 kilovolts, um, uh, the generator uh, in, in terms to be able to deliver the dose rates we need, which are close or above 100 gray per second. And some calculation I'm gonna show you in the next slide shows that you have to have a rotating anode X-ray source. Um, so the X-ray flash SARP system it's proposed to have parallel opposed uh, 150 uh, KVP sources. To attain this dose rate, it will be self-shielded, and these sources will rotate. And the reason you do that is because, based on some calculations uh, that uh, John's team has done, uh, you need, uh, uh, in, you see here the uh, dose rates uh, and the depth of dose in this phantom. Uh, if you have a parallel opposing beams versus if you have um, uh, angled beams, and you see here the, um, the graphs uh, showing the dose rate uh, in the parallel post and the beam angle here uh, along the um, alpha path or the beta path uh, down here. So this is the, the uh, outline of the two sources. They will be able to be either parallel and opposed, as you see on the right, or be the fixed angle. And uh, we think that this is very important because there is no studies as of yet with proton um, um, flash. It's only with particles, electrons, um, uh, protons, uh, as well as um, uh, carbon, which is a uh, group in Germany. So uh, I don't have any more time to, to go into more details. I, I want to acknowledge all the people who contributed to this work, a vast array of people at Penn, uh, collaborators at Hopkins. Uh, and I want to emphasize, if you look at this, all these biologists and physicists um, and, and clinicians come together because of the SARP. 
it's a great tool to bring different disciplines in our field uh, together. And I also want to acknowledge the funding, including the uh, NIH grant that allowed us to buy our first sub. Thank you. Thank you very much, Costas. That's a lot of uh, interesting gadgets that you have there or, or soon will have there. Um, I also strongly believe that an, uh, an, an X-ray uh, flash-capable system will be much more affordable than, uh, than yeah, a dedicated proton beam flash or, or uh, even an even electron uh, LINAC. So um, I guess it's too early to talk about numbers, but what's your feeling about this? Uh, about the, 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 the cost? Uh... Uh, yeah, basically, uh, yeah, I see you need two X-ray tubes, but uh, high-power X-ray tubes exist already. Yeah, that's that's existing technology. So, yeah, and I, I will let John uh, uh, chime in because, you know, we're only going to be the biology testing round. But, yes, there is a fluoroscopy, I believe, X-ray tube with that power, and John found it. So, John, you want to comment on this? John, are you still there? Can you uh, hear me? Yeah. yeah, we can hear you now, John. Okay. Uh, well, how much does it cost? Well, are you talking to me? Or are you talking extra? Oh. Uh, both, maybe. Uh, um, <laughs> ex ex I guess Frank also wants to know what is the what is the source uh, for the that. source is a is a uh, is a 150 kVp fluoroscopy tube. It's one level lower than the X-ray than the CT tube. If you have mm -hmm. a tube, will run for for a long, long time. But uh, this will run based on the usage. Uh, we think that you have a, a lifetime of uh, longer than five years, five to actually, you know, well, well into a, a, a eight years. And it, it is affordable. Um, so, uh, and the advantage of it is also instant beam on. It's not industrial tube anymore. So, uh, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's exciting. We think it can be done. But it, it is an existing tube, right? It's not something that still has to be developed. No, this is an existing. It's off the shelf. Yeah. yeah, that's beautiful. So we can have it quickly, I guess, all of us. <laughs> uh, all of us? Uh, where, where, where's Adrian Treverton? And where's Costas? Costas, Costas is a site to, 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 to put on the proton flash. And, and we hope that the NIH will, will fund uh, John's, uh, John's grant for this. Okay, very good. Uh, Christy, I don't see any questions from the participants, so let's move on to Dr. George Wilson from the William Beaumont Hospital. Excellent. So we got our SAP in May 2011, and um, unlike many of the installations, we decided to put it right in the animal facility, right next to a micro pet and a micro MRI that we have. And so we built this uh, little mini maze to try and um, reduce the, uh, the X-ray uh, contamination. But in the same room, we also have a, a cabinet X-ray. Uh, down here now, there is also a, a flow hood. And it shows that inside of the, the situation, the uh, installation, it's very open uh, because of having all the shielding on the outside rather than having the the cage that comes with a SARP. And originally we had the Mark I, but we did upgrade to the Mark II uh, a few years later. So I'm gonna talk about just three different projects, which um, are really very translational and very different to each other. Um, the first one is a very unusual project that we started way back in uh, 2007 or eight. And this was based on the idea that um, Alzheimer's disease, um, which is a neuroinflammatory disease or uh, dementia it's it's a growing problem and the treatments are currently not effective and new ideas were needed and at the time one of our radiation oncologists uh, dr jim fontanese really came up with the idea that for many years radiation oncologists have been treating systemic amyloidosis in, in the thorax and other organs with fairly low doses modest doses of radiation and very successfully getting good long-term control and so the idea came to us, well, systemic amyloidosis is amyloid beta. Why not uh, have a look at low-dose radiation in the context of Alzheimer's disease? And so we brought in the, the standard model, which is the APP PSF1 model. It uh, uh, has a defect in amyloid beta. 
Um, the mice produce amyloid beta after three to four months, and then they start to get cognitive decline at eight to 10 months. And the beauty of using radiation and using the SARP in particular was that unlike using systemic drugs, we're able to do a hemibrain irradiation. And so what you see mm -hmm. on the right here is a hemibrain irradiation where we've then stained for gamma H2AX. So you can see all of the brown staining, which is immunistic chemistry, showing the DNA damage, double strand breaks, only on the irradiated side and on the non, nothing on the non-irradiated side. So that was just a nice biological dosimeter that we can actually achieve very clean hemibrain irradiation with the SARP. More recently, we've been using the multivariable collimator to tailor this even more. So the, the idea of this then was to do hemibrain irradiation and then to look at uh, amyloid beta staining at uh, several weeks after the irradiation. We started off with, uh, with single doses, but then we found that fractionated doses were much more successful. And actually five fractions of two gray is the most successful uh, schedule that we have. And you can see down here on, on the bottom right that on the irradiated side, there are far fewer plaques uh, and far smaller plaques than on the non-irradiated side. This is really the first demonstration that we could actually reduce amyloid beta plaques uh, in vivo in the mouse model. And, and again, the beauty of radiation is you can see it all in a single cross section of the brain. We then went on to validate that by doing behavioral testing and cognitive testing. Uh, and we did that blindly with another group from Wayne State University and actually showed that radiation <coughs> improved the cognitive behavior of those mice. And then more recently, we've used a triple transgenic model, which also has a tau defect. And we've actually also shown, again, using this hemibrain irradiation, that uh, radiation can actually reduce tau uh, immunopositivity as well. So we don't believe that radiation is acting directly on both of those or either of those proteins. What we're actually believing and what we're looking at is whether radiation changes the neuroinflammatory phenotype, particularly of the microglia, from a, a, a pro-inflammatory to an anti-inflammatory phenotype with these low doses of radiation. And in fact, there's quite a lot of evidence from other uh, studies, mainly on, coming from Germany, which have been using low dose radiation for many years for inflammatory diseases and other degenerative diseases, that there is this anti-inflammatory effect of low dose radiation, which once you get to higher doses, it's, it's pro-inflammatory. So all of this work has really led to uh, uh, a clinical trial. And so this is a translation of this work. So you can see now we have a phase one feasibility trial of low dose whole brain radiation uh, for Alzheimer's disease. This trial has now been replicated at um, Virginia Commonwealth University, uh, University of Geneva, uh, and also in South Korea. So again, it's a very novel uh, idea. And then the beauty of the SARP, being able to do these very uh, distinct heavy brain irradiations to see the effect directly. A second study I'm going to talk about is uh, using pulse dose treatment of glioblastoma. And this is work that uh, Brian Marples uh, started many years ago with Mike Joyner at the Gray Lab when they identified low dose hyper radiosensitivity, uh, which was a phenomenon that there was actually more cell kill per unit dose once you got below 0.2 gray. And after many years of research and many iterations of how to actually exploit this, uh, they came up with the idea of pulsing the radiation dose. So instead of giving a two gray continuous dose, they give two gray uh, as 10 fractions of 0.2 gray separated by three minutes. And that, that was all worked out uh, by cells and culture. So originally we were using a, a, a faxitron system and irradiating uh, the brains just using some crude shielding. And you know, basically we couldn't we could see an increase in survival of these mice, but it wasn't very clear because basically we're causing cognitive damage and impairment. And the end point of all of these types of studies for a, a intracranial tumor is really the behavioral aspects of the mouse. And the mouse was really dying for other reasons. Once we got the start, we started to investigate different uh, ways of delivering the radiation. Initially, we had a three-field technique. We use a 45 degree vertex beam and then two uh, post, post lateral oblique beams. Uh, and again, we had a much cleaner uh, dose distribution, avoiding things like the eyes. And then more recently, we've gone to uh, a much more targeted uh, two arc system opposed by 90 degrees using a, a three, three by three collimator. 
And you can see that we can target the glioma much more accurately. And what this really means for translational research is because we're not causing the brain damage that we were causing in the past, we're actually seeing a much bigger and prolonged effect uh, of the uh, radiation treatment. And we can and now be we can now actually get 60 gray in, um, two gray per day, uh, and 10 gray per week. So it's now mimicking really a clinical schedule. And then you can see in this uh, those, this survival curve. Once we went to this much more targeted radiation, we were getting longer survival. And I haven't shown the data here, but the pulse radiation treatment actually improved survival over the, con the continuous or the conventional radiation treatment. So what this has uh, eventually been translated to is this last uh, reference down here, just been published uh, this month. And this was a, a trial of pulse radiation therapy for newly diagnosed glioblastoma. These patients got 60 gray, two gray fractions uh, in a pulse. So they were 0.2 gray separated by three minutes. They also had temozolomide. And the results of that trial have, have just been uh, quite phenomenal. The, our, our historical survival is about 14 months for these patients. And with the, the pulse treatment, that was increased to 21 months. And in fact, we also had improvements in some of their neurocognition and their quality of life questionnaires. So again, this pulse radiation treatment developed uh, from this translational research certainly begs the question of doing some more larger scale studies. The only problem with the treatment, of course, is that it takes much longer to deliver the radiation in the pulsed mode than it does with the conventional mode. The third study, again, which are, they're all very different to each other. Uh, this is work with our urology department, and they were very interested in looking at radiation cystitis and how we could model that. And again, the, the SARP became very important in this research by being able to deliver high doses of radiation in, in a very targeted way, avoiding um, all of the other uh, abdominal organs and just concentrating that dose on the on the uh, bladder. Uh, and so what we're delivering at the moment is 40 gray. Uh, we'd have uh, two uh, angles and we use different collimators depending on the size of the bladder, which we assess with CT. Uh, and then basically the urologists are doing two things. They're firstly looking at some of the, the genetics behind sensitivity to radiation and they have a whole series of different studies on different mouse models c57 black c3h bulb c etc and they're seeing some very uh, profound differences with uh, c57 blacks being the most susceptible and ch3 being the least susceptible but ultimately this model is being designed to try and then look at the effect of agents which can ameliorate the radiation effect uh, many prostate cancer patients uh, do suffer from radiation cystitis. So again, the translational aspect of this will be testing novel compounds in the mouse model where we can reproducibly uh, deliver radiation to cause the, uh, radiation cystitis. And then the, the, the area I'm just going to talk about, but we're not really got anything concrete on this yet, is that we've been doing a lot of work recently with our physics uh, department uh, we published a couple of papers recently where we've been doing multiple uh, PET scans in patients who are getting uh, conventional radiation treatment, uh, chemo radiation treatment for head and neck cancer. And we've been able to show that uh, the change in the FDG uh, uptake over time is actually a good measure of the response to radiation. Uh, and so what we're trying to do now is to try and model that in our mouse systems. Again, we, we have a micro PET spec CT. Uh, sitting right next door to the, uh, the SAR. Uh, we now have a, a universal bed that we can take to the, 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 uh, the PET CT. We can also take it to our micro MRI. And the idea now is to actually do dose painting based on the changes in FDG over time. And again, trying to model that in the mouse. It's not so easy in the mouse model because the FDG uptake, the SUVs are about one, whereas in, in patients, they're about 20. Uh, but this is something that we're now trying to, to put into practice, again, using the SARP to deliver uh, uh, increased or decreased doses of radiation, depending on the change of the, uh, the, the PET signal. So those are the areas I just wanted to talk about, and I'd be happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you very much, George. We actually have a question for you from Dr. Chalmers, from our own panelist. Thank you very much. Um, great talk, George. Um, well, it's two things, really. One is just to say congratulations on that um, 
low dose pulsed um, study in GBM. It was really exciting. Um, you'll probably remember my PhD was looking at low dose hypersensitivity in glioma, well, <laughs> in glioma cells. So uh, to see something come of that is really amazing. Um, I was also going to ask you about the Alzheimer's study, which again is hugely innovative and exciting. I wondered how um, how clear it is that two gray per fraction is the is the optimum dose because I know that five times two gray seems like a relatively low dose, but I'm a bit worried that it's actually quite a significant dose to give to the whole brain of a patient with Alzheimer's disease. Whereas if you were able to drop the dose per fraction, for example, to one gray and still get an effect, you were probably out of that sort of danger zone for causing toxicity for those patients. We actually have looked at the comparison of uh, one gray times 10 and two gray times five. And actually the one gray times 10 is not as effective as reducing the plaques. We didn't do any uh, cognitive testing at that dose, mm -hmm. uh, but I think the fact that we see an improvement in the cognition of the experimental mouse at the two gray, uh, we feel fairly comfortable with that dose. And in fact, the clinical trial that's been developed, um, the first arm is two gray times five, but actually they want to escalate it to two gray times 10. Now, uh, there's a lot of discussion over that. We actually showed also the two gray times 10 was more effective than two gray times five at reducing plaques, but it wasn't a huge difference. And I, I, I really am I'm not that keen to go to the higher dose. I think keeping at two gray times five, which is also very similar to the doses that the Europeans, the Germans in particular, use for a lot of their benign uh, radiotherapy indications. So um, the, the whole question of dose the frequency of dosing is still something we want to do a lot more work on. But as you can imagine, these experiments take forever. You have to age the mice to 10, 12 months and then wait and wait to see the effect. So uh, it's just a matter of time and money to, to be able to really dissect the whole dose intensity question yeah. in, the, in this. Uh, but we're pretty happy that what we're giving is, is safe. Um, there has been some preliminary data that's come out of one of the centers. Uh, they treated, they have five patients who are out to a year. Four of the five patients are actually stable with all of their cognitive testing, no toxicity. And actually they're even increasing now between nine and 12 months in some of their executive functions and, and learning. So there's some very early evidence that in patients it's safe and that there may be the stabilization. We don't expect to cure Alzheimer's, but we think we might stabilize it and at least reduce some of the symptoms potentially. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. So our next speaker is uh, Anthony, that's yourself, Dr. Anthony Chalmers, so please take the floor. Right, thank you very much. Um, can you see my screen okay? Thank you. <laughs> There's always that worry that nobody can see it. Okay, um, so I'm gonna talk mainly about glioblastoma, which I'm still working on. Um, uh, and a little bit at the end about rectal cancer. And I have to thank our SARP technician, Katrina Stevenson, who's done a lot of this work, along with Alistair Rutherford from physics and Michael Gillespie, who um, is a surgeon actually doing a PhD and developing the rectal models. So GBM, um, we all know is a terrible um, disease. Standard of care is surgery followed by radiation and chemotherapy. And we usually have recurrence within the radiated volume indicating radio resistance. But we also have this infiltration of the tumor cells. And if you look post-mortem, you can often see GBM cells inf infiltrating the entire brain. And then we have the other issue to worry about is although radiation has some benefits in these patients, as I've just been saying, we do know that it causes a neurocognitive decline in some patients, particularly the elderly patients who are very susceptible to this. So we've been studying a number of questions. So can we improve outcomes by combining radiotherapy with radiosensitizing drugs? And if so, what are those effects on the normal brain? And then the other thing we've been looking at more recently is the impact of radiation on invasion. Uh, and there's actually increasing evidence now that radiation um, does promote the invasive capacity and behavior of glioblastoma cells, uh, which um, tends to inhibit its, its overall benefit. 
So we've been using the SARP to help us answer some of these questions. So our main model for the tumors is a xenograft model of glioblastoma using primary patient-derived cell lines, which are injected orthotopically into uh, immunodeficient mice, as shown on the left. And we have a number of models. We have a highly infiltrative model over on the right, the E2. And then the G7 is our sort of workhorse, which is, it does form uh, a tumor mass, not particularly apparent on this image, but it's also got very infiltrative edges. So it's quite a good um, model to represent the human disease. And we can show uh, that radiation has modest improvement on survival in mice um, bearing these tumors. So our um, publication a couple of years ago was looking at this um, phenomenon of radiation promoted invasion. Uh, and what we saw um, is that there was a clear effect. So what we measured was the proportion or the percentage of tumor cells that were visible or detectable in the contralateral hemisphere. Uh, and you can see that we have got tumor cells here in brown crossing over to the midline. And if we quantify that, uh, we can see a big increase when these tumors have been irradiated. And we knew that this molecule MRCK was important in motility of glioma cells. Uh, and what we found was that if we inhibited that either genetically or with a small molecule inhibitor, we could completely block this impact of radiation on uh, invasion in this model. And we were a little bit surprised, but very pleased that that actually led to an improvement in overall survival of the mice. Um, so controlling invasion in these tumors does, it seems, contribute to overall outcomes. So that's something we're keen to continue to investigate, ideally in patients. Obviously for this, um, the mode of irradiation is quite important. Uh, and we were generally using parallel opposed beams for all our orthotopic tumor models because we could um, confidently encompass the tumor uh, and we could spare some of the anterior and posterior parts of the brain. But actually in this invasion model, uh, that does raise some other questions. So if we're irradiating the contralateral hemisphere, is that somehow contributing to the invasion of the tumor cells across the midline into that irradiated part of the brain. Um, so in order to sort of try and tease that apart, uh, we are now using this um, alternative, still very simple beam arrangement, um, just a superior beam to irradiate uh, within a single hemisphere as, as George has described earlier. So this is going to enable us to ask a question, is the effect of the radiation purely on the tumor cells or is an effect of radiation on the normal brain also enhancing uh, invasion of these tumor cells? So just a very simple example of how we can use SARP to um, give us a bit of extra detail there. Talking of adverse effects of radiation on the brain, um, one thing that we've been quite interested to observe is that um, if we only irradiate one hemisphere, so this is using that um, superior beam, but a, a larger collimator, um, we actually induce um, a neuroinflammation in both hemispheres. So in this uh, example, we're using GFAP to look at um, activated astrocytes, and there's clearly more activation in the irradiated hemisphere. Um, but actually, it's certainly detectable in the non-irradiated hemisphere as well. And this sort of chimed with us because when we treat patients um, with focal radiotherapy for their GBM and then follow them up, we often see generalized cerebral atrophy further down the line, 12 months, 24 months later, um, suggesting effects of the radiation beyond the actual irradiated volume. To get a little bit more sophisticated, we wanted to look at whether we could optimize irradiation of our GBM models um, further. Um, and so this is where Alistair Rutherford's work came in, uh, looking at some simple beam arrangements as I've described, but also some arc arrangements, um, either through the gantry or couch. So Alistair um, was able to define 
the tumor and the organs at risk, including the eyes, the brain stem, the mouth, uh, contralateral brain and ipsilateral brain, and did some nice um, dosimetry studies. Um, this is the parallel opposed that you've seen already. Um, so the tumor coverage is in blue and you can see it's very good. And we have with this model, uh, irradiation of a portion of the ipsilateral and the contralateral brain. With the um, superior beam, we can uh, completely eliminate the contralateral brain as described. And then with the gantry arcs, uh, we have uh, a variety of different scenarios. Uh, so with the gantry arc, we can um, get good dose distributions, uh, but this is probably not um, reflective of the clinical scenario we, when we tend to irradiate the tumor and a margin around that. Uh, whereas the couch arcs give us a plan that's much more um, representative of a clinical plan. And so if you are interested in looking at uh, immune effects in the vicinity of the tumor, um, you may wish to use this kind of um, system where you're getting a more clinically relevant uh, dose distribution. It did come at the slight expense of dose to the contralateral brain, but those are marginal effects. Uh, and you can see uh, with different angles, um, slightly different DVHs as well. Um, so just comparing them all, really, they were all very safe to give, very good tumor coverage in all of them, differential effects on ipsilateral and contralateral brain. Um, a couple of them affected the brainstem, but these are uh, very low percentages here, around 10%. Uh, and I was pleased that none of them really gave significant dose to the mouth. And then just to finish off, um, some newer work looking at orthotopic transplant models of rectal cancer. So these uh, studies are to investigate immune responses to radiation in rectal cancer. Uh, and what we've done, collaboration with Owen Sansom's team in the Beetson is to develop syngeneic um, tumors derived from murine tumors, uh, which have been cultured as organoids and then injected in immunocompetent mice uh, using a colonoscopy to inject these organoids submucosally um, so that we have the tumors growing in the correct anatomical location. The organoids have been engineered to um, express combinations of common colorectal cancer driver mutations as shown here. And the histology of these uh, is very reflective of the human disease. So using um, SARP, we've been able to demonstrate an induction of DNA damage in these um, tumors. Um, and as I mentioned, we want to use this to really study the immune response to radiation uh, in these um, immunocompetent mice. So a very simple system is just, again, to use a single superior beam. Um, in some of our mice, we can very clearly see the rectum because it contains gas. But in others, such as this one, you can't. So this is still fairly um, speculative isocenter placement and planning. We are endeavoring to improve this with the use of um, uh, enemas, either of air or perhaps a contrast agent to improve um, organ delineation here. And then we're also looking at the use of arcs to perhaps spare uh, some of the normal tissues, because obviously when we're looking at the immune response, um, the irradiation of the adjacent normal tissues can play a key role in that. Um, so this first attempt with this arc set up, uh, we showed that we can very nicely exclude air from the volume, um, but that's about it. So we're now testing a different um, setup. And in this one, we're specifically aiming to exclude the spine and the bone marrow from the volume. Uh, and here, I think we've shown that we're capable of doing that with this beam setup. So just a couple of examples, really, to show how the SARP can accurately deliver complex plans to the brain and the rectum. And I think these are really important when you're interested not only in tumor responses, but also in responses of the adjacent normal tissues, um, and also for longer term studies where you want to look um, at late effects of radiation, it's important not to cause um, severe damage to large volumes of tissue that would sort of compromise your, your endpoints. Um, 
and really important ob it's an obvious point but the the technique you use really depends on what question you're asking and which are the important targets to either include or exclude and i think as many people will agree uh, it's often necessary to uh, include additional imaging if you want um, to achieve really good tumor visualization uh, on the SARP. So I will finish there and be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Anthony. Um, we're running a bit late, so I propose that we keep uh, the questions for the end of the discussion and first have the, the other two speakers, if you don't mind. Sure. So the next speaker is then uh, Dr. Shandan Gua from uh, the Montefiore Medical Center. Good morning. Uh, this is Chandan Guha. Um, I am the uh, Vice Chairman and uh, Professor of Radiation Oncology at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Uh, you, as you can see, we at Einstein um, and Montefiore have founded an institute called Institute for Oncophysics. Uh, this allows us to do physical sciences in cancer and stem cell biology. I have been at Einstein since 1995, so 25 years. And what you are going to see are the two uh, interesting applications of radiation, preclinical modeling, and how the Small Animal Radiation Research Platform, or SHARP, as we fondly call, uh, plays a huge role for uh, very innovative research in stem cell biology. And then towards the end, I'll give some examples of how SHARP can play a role in immune oncology. Uh, these are my grants, conflicts, and disclosures, um, but uh, none of these uh, have any uh, conflict with uh, what I'm going to present. Um, so as I say that when I started uh, my research, that was in the uh, 90s, uh, we had Essentially, you have to play with LINAC or cesium radiators or a very old-fashioned Philips orthovoltage radiator. And what I will show you that in the beginning, how difficult it was to do uh, an experiment where a focal high-dose radiation needs to be given to an organ. Um, and over the years, we were one of the first ones to uh, use SHARP and play with it. And over the years, several very novel, unique models have been developed in our institute. For example, I can do focal high-dose liver radiation to a half a lobe of the liver or one lobe within mice. Um, we can, of course, do you know whole abdominal or whole thoracic radiation. Um, we also uh, um, innovated a hippocampal sparing whole brain radiation. Um, and to study stem cell biology, we have been uh, in mouse, uh, prostate uh, is divided into right and left two lobes. So we can give a unilateral prostate lobe radiation, targeted kidney radiation, as well as targeted draining lymph node radiation and radiation proctitis. So what you are seeing is that even though it's very challenging to work in small animals and in most centers the best you can do is a whole body radiation using box radiators or cesium radiators sharp allows you to do image guided dosimetry for doing very focal uh, organ radiation uh, throughout the body and from brain all the way to the rectum and limbs extremities, we have done s several um, uh, very innovative um, studies over the years, which has been published, and uh, the publication list is available from uh, Extra. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show some examples of it. Uh, this is an example of how we do the focal high-dose liver radiation on the left and hippocampal sparing whole brain radiation on the right. Uh, we have examples of whole abdominal radiation, 
or proctitis or unilateral prostate radiation, as you see on the right. Um, so why did we design such studies? Essentially, we were one of the initial um, contributors in the field of regenerative medicine where radiation is used as a preparative regimen. Normally, um, you know, uh, since the 60s, as you know, the Nobel Prize winning um, uh, studies on bone marrow uh, transplantation have shown that whole body radiation can ablate the bone marrow. And then if you do a transplant, you will engraft and repopulate the bone marrow. And that's the paradigm which have been absolutely textbook uh, like for um, uh, donor cells which are transplanted, they engraft in the radiated host microenvironment and eventually replace the host cells by the donor cells. So that's the repopulation. Now that paradigm, unfortunately, have never been used for solid organs. And at Einstein, we were the first to show that we can take such a paradigm or where donor cells engraft and repopulate in the radiated host en environment uh, in several tissues, such as liver. Um, and essentially, we show that parenchymal cells, such as liver parenchymal stem cells or liver adult hepatocytes, as well as endothelial cells, can engraft and repopulate in environment uh, which has been radiated. Now, this is mainly valuable because radiation-induced liver disease is a sinusoidal obstruction syndrome, and I don't need to uh, show uh, these two type of syndromes, one which is related with radiation-induced endothelial cell death in the liver, and the other which is related with radiation-induced inhibition of hepatocellular proliferation in a, um, after parenchymal injury. In the center, what we see is that these models have been duplicated uh, from not just, you know, from seen originally in patients, but for animal models, we have been doing work in um, uh, mouse, rats, mini pigs, and non-human primates. And some of those examples of sinusoidal obstruction is seen in the, in the histology, uh, uh, which is shown in the middle. Now, I don't need, I just wanted to show you that with the sharp, what we have done. So as you see in a five millimeter uh, collimators, you know, cone, uh, you see a radiation track. This is a SPECT CT scan where we give a technetium labeled, which is taken up by the hepatocytes, which are bright orange color. However, in that track, which is five millimeter in diameter, you see that the dye is not taken up by those hepatocytes. This is because this is uh, the, the radiation tract as it goes through the liver, it kills the sinusoidal endothelial cells, which doesn't allow the dye through the portal circulation to come to the liver. However, we have designed experiments where we have transplanted after a 50 gray single fraction of radiation, we have transplanted liver sinusoidal endothelial cells along with a growth factor, and as seen in C, completely repaired the sinusoidal obstruction defect that now you have the liver which is back in normal physiology and is taking the dye and there is uptake. This is two months after radiation and endothelial cell transplant. Now, over the years, we have published many papers, and essentially these papers show that we can use a model. For example, this yellow rat is jaundiced because it misses out a, um, the liver cells do not express an enzyme which conjugates bilirubin. So it's a model of Kriegler-Najjar syndrome. So we can uh, resect out a small piece of liver from this animal, and then transduce the human uh, UGT1A1, the glucuronyl transferase gene, and then select the corrected immortalized hepatocytes, and then give a preparative radiation along with growth factor, and now do a transplant of these engineered cells. So that model 
uh, similar studies have been done, for example, in Kriglanager syndrome, you see before transplant, there is no brown stain. We now transplant these small, tiny colonies, as you see in two weeks. These are the hepatocytes which have been corrected for the gene, and now they can you know, stain for glucuronyl transferase. Within eight weeks, you, these colonies become enlarged, and by 16 weeks, we can see we have near total replacement of the radiated lobe with the donor cells. Uh, in the bottom slide, what you see is the serum bilirubin. As you know, in Triglanager, uh, you have jaundice. So you see the red car line, which has the transplant alone without radiation. But once we give radiation and then transplant, then you see over time, there is reduction of the bilirubin. Another example is primary hypercholesterolemia. The cholesterol levels are high. But as you see in black six mice, the plasma is transparent. In APOE knockout mice, where you have triglyceride and cholesterol levels high in the plasma, the chylomicrons make the plasma milky. But once this same mice gets radiation using the sharp and then cell therapy, along with the growth factor, you see the plasma has totally become transparent instead of milky. And that is shown here with the lowering of the uh, plasma cholesterol. Another example is primary hyperoxaluria. Basically, there is a defect uh, where the enzyme, which uh, catabolizes uh, oxalate, is not present in the liver. So what unfortunately happens is that you get bladder and kidney stones in these patients and eventually the kidney fails from obstructive nephropathy. These patients, eventually, the only way it can, they can be treated is by doing a kidney and a liver transplant. We show here in a mouse model that if you do just liver cell transplant, which has the enzyme, which metabolize, uh, catabolize uh, oxalic acid, uh, just without radiation, uh, in this case, we get hepatocyte growth factor. You see that there are still hyper um, uh, serum levels of increased oxalic acid, oxalate, and uh, stones, as you see those crystals in the urine of these mice. But if now we transplant these blue cells, which have the enzyme for the ASGT, over time, eight weeks, you see these nice colonies, and by 16 weeks, you have a near total replacement, and now disappearance of the oxalic acid crystals in the urine. So these are examples of using SHARP for focal radiation of the liver, and thereby allow the stem cell biologist induce pluripotent stem cells, primary hepatocytes, hepatic oval cells or stem cells, endothelial cells, all of them can use these uh, very focal radiation using SHARP and then do these very sophisticated um, you know, experiments for uh, cell therapy, which then can be an alternative to orthotopic organ transplant. Now, uh, I just want to show one other example where we used the SHARP to study um, immuno, uh, radiation based immunomodulation. Uh, we were one of the first, in fact, the first lab to show radioimmunology uh, of in situ tumor vaccines in the 90s. Our main goal was uh, that uh, we would do a focal therapy and engineer the tumor microenvironment to drive systemic immunity, which will eventually lead to focal therapy for systemic cure. And um, over the years, what we have discovered that radiation is essentially an immunomodulatory drug. And you have the ablative radiation, which is used for stereotactic radiosurgery or stereotactic ablative body radiotherapy, which are very immunogenic and ablative, so it's immunogenic ablative radiation. Examples of single fraction, uh, 34 gray, 24 to 34 gray, uh, three fractions of 18 gray or 
you know, five fractions of 10 to 12 gray are such examples. You also have a relatively subablative but immunomodulatory radiation, such as eight gray times three or six gray times five. And we also have discovered that very low dose of radiation, 0.5 gray and lower, can modulate the tumor microenvironment. And essentially, the immunogenic ablative dose and immunomodulatory dose and the tumor microenvironment modulating dose behaves as three separate drugs for radiation. Um, initially, our idea was that if you give radiation, then you can cause immunogenic cell death. And now, normally these cells are cleared by neutrophils and macrophages in the tissue, which are not professional antigen-presenting cells. We discovered in the 90s that there is a normal growth factor in the body called flat 3 ligand that allows immature dendritic cells come out from the bone marrow in the circulation and then flow through a radiated um, tumor and essentially phagocytos or engulf radiated tumor cells as we know that there are special eat me signals expressed on the cell surface of radiated tumor cells which are dying once these cells engulf the radiated tumor cell along with all the mutations in the tumor now the the immune system has been has evolved to recognize strangers or dangers in the body. By strangers, you mean conformation like bacterial proteins, viral proteins, which are normally not present inside the body. The body reacts as if, as a stranger has invaded. And the idea is either through cell-mediated immunity or through antibody-mediated immunity or through adapt innate immune systems such as NK cells and macrophages, they want to clean up these or clear up these strangers. What we did was by giving an ablative radiation and then flat three ligand, we allowed these specialized professional antigen presenting cells to come and eat up the radiated dying tumor cells and then migrate to the draining lymph node and present these antigens to the helper uh, T cells and eventually to the cytotoxic T cells, which you see in blue, these are assassins which then come out of the draining lymph node and look for other microscopic metastatic tumor throughout the body. And this happens because of viral mimicry by radiation. Now, uh, this was a paper published in 1999 and essentially shows that ablative radiation, 60 gray, can lead to a long-term cure after flat three ligand in a highly metastatic lung cancer model. Uh, subsequently, there were other groups which showed that even though subablative radiation, such as eight gray times three, can cause abscopal effect, but survival do it doesn't improve. So what we did was uh, this immunity results in an immune memory as well as a very strong T helper subset one immunity, which subsequently allows cytotoxic T cells to come out. Now, it, that study has now evolved into much precise radiation techniques where you can either treat the primary tumor or treat the draining lymph node which is a big uh, issue in clinical medicine, clinical radiation oncology, where we do elective nodal radiation. So just wanted to show that a clinical trial has shown that these preclinical work can have an abscopal effect. As you see, we did a large, like we, instead of treating, this is a patient, 55 year old lady who had failed radiation, chemotherapy and immunotherapy, and then came to us. And what we see is that she has two lesions, one large primary in the right lung and a tiny metastasis um, you know, uh, on the left lung. We decided to treat the 
metastatic disease with a large with a single fraction of 34 gray on the left side which is circled in red and then uh, observe what happens to the primary tumor which is circled in green and as you see over time there is a complete response not only of the radiated lesion but also of the unradiated lesion and this patient uh, lived for more than two and a half years without any subsequent systemic chemotherapy or immunotherapy there are other examples where we treated the lung tumor with five fractions of 10 gray and saw an abscopal effect in the bone lesions. Uh, unfortunately, this patient was free of disease for 12 months, but then there was recurrence exactly where we treated with 10 gray times five, uh, indicating that many of these so-called ablative radiation doses are uh, producing local control, but if the patient survives long enough, then we may see a failure in the primary site. There are examples of pleural mets and pleural effusion going away and supraclavicular nodes going away, showing abscopal effects of this trial. So over the years, uh, these studies, uh, which initially started with, for us, it was always a survival study using radiation and immunotherapy, uh, and and also seeing abscopal effects, uh, we have used the SARF, uh, you know, uh, radiator to optimize these radiation techniques. What should be the fractionation? What should be the tumor volume? How do you treat the lymph nodes? Uh, all these questions can be answered. Then the sequencing of radiation and immunotherapy as well as how to sequence uh, or uh, how to combine radiation with immunomodulatory chemotherapy, all of these have really been studied using the SHARP models. So with that, I just want to uh, show that the future uh, of this um, you know, platform is precision image-guided energy with precision immunotherapeutics, uh, which is being studied a platform of developing very novel and targeted immunotherapeutic platforms. Now, so far, the PD-1s are like non-specific. All T cells, you, you remove the breaks. But Dr. Almo is developing a special uh, a protein platform which only activates the specific T cell against a particular epitope. And again, all these studies have been possible because of focal therapy uh, image guided uh, with very precise dosimetry possible uh, in mouse using the sharp. So this, finally, I want to thank my team. Uh, uh, we call it the RADVAC team uh, at uh, Einstein. Thank you. Great, thank you. So um, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be able to speak to you this evening from a, a very dark um, and wintry Belfast. And uh, it's a pleasure to uh, join all, all my uh, colleagues around the world to talk about some of the successes from Queen's University uh, Belfast, where we have been implementing um, SARP as a central component of our research program over the past uh, five or six years. So in fact, we were SARP number 15, and uh, I'd just live, like to give a very brief background to uh, the facility in Belfast and our research group. So um, really we've been building a multidisciplinary radiation research group that, that really um, came to pass in 20, uh, 2007. And uh, this was really a result of uh, dynamic leadership in basic science and radiation biology with input from um, clinical physics and our colleagues at the Cancer Centre. And since then, really, we've been um, driving to improve outcomes from radiotherapy through clinical and transcranial research, informed by laboratory discovery and clinical observation. And it's really um, that around these uh, this core mission that um, we've been building our SART program. We were fortunate in 2014 to secure uh, a grant from a local charity, Friends of the Cancer Centre, uh, to purchase our SARP, and um, it was then that we had it installed and began executing a number of different lines of investigation. 
So broadly speaking, over the past um, several years since we've had our SARP, uh, we have been trying to uh, develop a number of different key areas, which really, uh, as we've heard some from some of the speakers today, uh, are very similar to ongoing efforts around the world. So I think, uh, first of all, we've been developing a number of different drug radiotherapy combinations. Uh, we have had historical interests in the application of high atomic number metal nanoparticles as radiosensitizing agents. Uh, Professor Berbico is also very active in this area. We're also interested in um, combining radiotherapy with molecular targeted agents, particularly um, agents such as inhibitors of DNA damage response, uh, chemokine signaling and also epigenetic therapies. And then more recently, we have emerging interests in uh, the repurposing of drugs and also in tumor metabolism. The second area of interest um, that we've been working in really follows uh, the implementation of some key radiotherapy technologies, such as the application of injectable fiducial markers for preclinical applications. We have some ongoing and early interests in uh, the development and application of advanced imaging for preclinical applications using radiomics, and then also uh, in, in um, novel aspects of radiation dosimeters, and also trying to optimize radiotherapy based on very complex and novel uh, beam delivery methods, such as spatially fractionated radiotherapy grid and lattice type of approaches. The final area then and um, that we've been working in is really trying to um, model some clinical trials and reverse the translational research process. So trying to um, take clinical evidence, uh, develop new models that we can establish in the laboratory and then take them forward to um, gain some mechanistic insight and critical information as to what's going on that couldn't be possible in um, trials in patients. And these are some of the key areas, looking at substructure avoidance, uh, a number of local trials for um, SBRT and prostate cancer, and it's um, importantly model, trying to model some different um, patient comorbidities that may have significant impacts on radiotherapy response. So I'd just like to highlight really two of our key successes. I should also qualify that we've had of course, many failures over the years in trying to implement a successful um, research program with SARP at the center of this. So um, I'd like to give uh, our first example, which really centers on the use of the inhibitors of the DNA damage response to modulate um, how uh, tumors and, and normal tissues may respond um, to the combination of the AstraZeneca ATR inhibitor, AZD6738, and this was driven by um, a, a previous faculty member within our centre, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Jerry Hanna, um, who is now at the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre. This study was funded by Cancer Research UK um, through the New Agents Committee. And essentially, uh, the, the design of the study was to simultaneously investigate tumour efficacy in a number of different um, tumour models and then also um, to exploit the onboard imaging capacity of SARP to look at um, tissue density changes, uh, late occurring tissue density changes representing the development of radiation-induced fibrosis in mouse lung. I'll refer you to the publication here to, to learn more about the study, but um, essentially we were able to demonstrate uh, an improved um, tumour response and then also um, comparable levels of uh, toxicity as measured by late occurring fibrosis in the mouse lung. This study uh, really attracted some national attention. It was identified by the Experimental Cancer Medicine Centre, uh, an initiative really set up in the UK to facilitate um, translational studies. Uh, and we were, we were highlighted as uh, a case study of success in this area. And then also um, the work has progressed to clinical evaluation through the Concord trial, which is a phase one platform study that will aim to investigate five different uh, inhibitors of the DNA damage response in combination with radiotherapy. Uh, this is a UK uh, national study led by uh, several investigators across the UK and, uh, and of course from our 
co-panel member, um, Professor Chalmers. And uh, we're really delighted in Belfast to be, to be part of this trial, um, and we'll be inputting into a lot of the translational sample analysis, uh, in particular relating to uh, biomarkers of pulmonary toxicity. So to continue then, um, I mentioned that we've also been um, focusing on trying to replicate and model some clinical data sets. And um, really, we've been interested in looking at um, different aspects of radiation-induced cardiac toxicity. We've been collaborating with um, colleagues at the University of Manchester for several years, and uh, Professor Kay Williams highlighted a very interesting study that had emerged um, from Alan McWilliam and Marcel Van Herk through retrospective data mining of a cohort of more than 400 non-small cell lung cancer patients receiving radical radiotherapy, in which they were able to identify a statistically significant region located in the base of the heart that was associated with poor outcomes in this cohort of radiotherapy patients. They also showed a dose threshold uh, with stratification at around 8.5 gray. So here you see uh, patients who had um, doses of greater than 8.5 gray delivered to this region of the base of the heart did significantly poor, uh, had significantly worse outcomes um, in terms of overall survival than those who had received doses of less than 8.5 gray to this uh, particular region of the heart. After many discussions, um, we then set about trying to develop a preclinical model to explore these um, potential effects on cardiac subvolumes. What we came up with was uh, the using a, a six by nine collimator to deliver parallel opposed fields targeting either the base, the middle, or the apex of the heart using SARC. Again, I'll refer you to the paper, but essentially we were able to recapitulate the clinical phenotype where mice that had the base of the heart irradiated showed uh, significantly worse cardiac dysfunction uh, in comparison to the other um, irradiated groups. And we're very excited about this data. Uh, this essentially is the first study that um, has been able to exploit uh, onboard image guidance to target discrete subvolumes of, of the heart, and I think is really a great step forward away from classical uh, classical approaches using whole heart or uh, whole thorax or radiation for these types of studies. So to finish, I thought it would be useful just to highlight um, some of the future opportunities that I believe will um, advance the field over the next decade for SARP. So I think um, a potential opportunity is to establish um, SARP at the center of a robust phase test testing platform for, for drug radiotherapy combinations. This will require, of course, uh, a, a portfolio of translationally relevant disease models, uh, optimizing um, delivery methods and um, schedules uh, with appropriate um, response monitoring using clinically relevant techniques. In addition, I think there's also possibility to explore um, novel radiobiological paradigms um, based on optimized dose delivery parameters. We've seen a, a lot of interest around um, optimizing spatial dose delivery uh, using a number of, of different techniques, some of which are beginning to translate to the clinic. We've seen um, really uh, tremendous innovations from um, Professor Kamenis's group in terms of the application of SARP beamline uh, to study the radio biological eff effects of protons, flash radiotherapy, and then also proton flash. Using this uh, image guidance, um, we've been able to look at uh, critical substructures within target organs of risk, which really wouldn't have been um, possible using conventional approaches. Finally, then, I think there's huge opportunity to integrate SARP, to continue to, to integrate SARP with novel video therapy and imaging technologies uh, from both the physics perspective of automated segmentation, treatment planning optimization, image analysis, and uh, online adaptive radio therapy, and then also com combining this with molecular and functional imaging to um, biologically optimize and target specific regions within tumors and normal tissues. So I'd like to uh, leave it there. Um, first of all, uh, finally, just thank all members of the, the lab, past and present, 
the Advanced Radiotherapy Group at uh, Queen's, our many collaborators and colleagues in the small animal radiotherapy field. It's been a, a pleasure to be part of this um, field for the past six years and uh, hugely exciting to see what will be delivered in the next decade. And then of course, a congratulations to John and Adrian for the tremendous achievements, not only in the invention of SARP, but also the commercialization and establishing a very vibrant uh, and innovative research community. Thank you, Christy. Thank you very much, Carl, for this very exciting work. Actually, we have a question, uh, not directly for you, but indirectly, I guess it's for many speakers. It's um, directly um, directed towards Anthony. <clears throat> a question from Ludwig Dubois. Should we, in preclinical GBM research, apply a beam targeting GTV as good as possible or more in a clinically relevant matter? And uh, I also have a question related to that. Should we actually develop something like VMAT or IMRT for, for mice, or is uh, ARCs good enough? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I think it depends on what your GBM model looks like. Um, so if, you, if you're very confident about the growth pattern of your tumor, um, then I think you can um, define your treatment approach in order to suit that. So for a more infiltrative model, then I think you would definitely need to include a PTV. Um, but if you know it's very well-defined, circumscribed, then a, a, a GTV might be appropriate. Um, I'd also, I think, depends partly on what your end point is. Um, if you're looking at sort of tumor control, or if you're interested in and in spread beyond the initial volume, you, you, may, you may have different... Um, Aims, but I guess the, the key message is just to tailor it to your model. Mm -hmm. a, a very important uh, general question for the panel is um, we've seen some of your studies have resulted in, uh, in clinical trials, um, but I think this is still quite rare in this field, although this field has existed for, for more than 10 years now. Or, uh, so does any of the panelists want to comment on this? What should we do to, to push these uh, preclinical studies more into clinical trials? Yeah, maybe I can start this question. Uh, at Penn, uh, um, there have been three trials that I mentioned centered around um, the combination of radiation therapy with um, immune checkpoint inhibitors pioneered by Andimin, uh, Dr. Von der Heidt, the cancer director, uh, and others. Uh, Amit Mehdi is also involved in that. And really, the impetus for that was, you know, the nature paper I briefly mentioned, I didn't show in detail, where the, you radiate, uh, you have two tumors and you radiate the abscobal tumor, other presenters presented similar data. And then when you combine with uh, anti-CTLA-4 or anti-PD-1, you get a much bigger um, improvement in, in survival. So based on that data, uh, they initiated these trials and they're ongoing. We're, we're expecting results soon. And also additional studies of what the patients that do not respond you go back to the mouse model, you know, both pancreatic and melanoma and, um, and, and lung uh, models, and you ask question, wh why is the resistance? And uh, Andy was able to isolate the resistant clones and, and found that other pathways, um, uh, like the jack start pathway may contribute, and, and there's new trials being designed. So the, the ability to go from the SARP to the mouse and back is really important. Um, also, I also briefly touched upon some of our um, uh, flash studies where we started with the mouse and then we moved the sarcoma model. I didn't have time to show the data, but we're showing that you can improve skin toxicity by flash while controlling uh, a sarcoma. And then we moved to a canine model. Now the canine, of course, cannot fit into the SAR, but it informs a lot of our trials there. We're doing, we're finishing a preliminary phase one trial and we're moving into a definitive phase one, two trial, which we think is very critical for bringing flash into the clinic. So we started with the SARP, but now we're going in, into the clinic. So that's been our experience, and I'm, I'm sure other uh, panelists may have similar uh, uh, experiences to share. Mm -hmm. It looks like Carl is uh, quite eager to answer that one, or? No? <laughs> No, I mean, I, I think it's it's very challenging. And as, as a community, we have to 
try and refine our models to get as close as possible to reflecting different um, aspects of biology in uh, patient radiotherapy response and then um, trying to get our actual beam deliveries uh, as close as possible to the clinic. In terms of the, the, the challenges of translating research from the laboratory to the clinic, uh, of course, this is a, a very um, a time inefficient process for, for many different reasons. Um, and it, it's really about being um, part of a multidisciplinary team with the input from um, clinicians who are, are very aware of the requirements uh, and safety um, uh, issues for um, things to progress to, to first in human um, trials. Maybe Anthony, you could, you could also comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've spent quite a lot of my career trying to do this. Um, the most important factor to me seems to be somehow capturing the imagination of the pharmaceutical companies. And I think to some extent you can do that with high quality biology using high quality preclinical models, um, et cetera. But in the end, they're not gonna take it forward unless they're excited by the prospect. Um, and so I think that's why the immunotherapy combinations have progressed because pharmaceutical companies are excited by immuno immunotherapy. Um, in the longer term, it's important for us as a community to educate pharmaceutical companies about radiotherapy, um, about radiotherapy drug combinations. Um, and obviously, you know, some of us have been trying to do that for quite a long time. The more of us there are doing good work and the more that progresses to the clinic, I think the easier it will get. But from, from my perspective, it, it, it has been that, that barrier about getting real enthusiasm from the pharma companies, because without that, they're not going to spend the money. Um, and, you know, I was really amazed to, to find out how much money it actually costs to run certainly a, a phase three trial. Um, so yeah, it, it's a bit of a generic question um, answer, but I think in my experience, that has been the most important thing. Mm -hmm. any, any of the other panel members have an opinion? I can just share that getting the low-dose radiation treatment of Alzheimer's to a clinical trial was a, a marathon. It took us nearly eight years. We had to get uh, FTA approval for IDE exemption for a new use for radiation and for them to actually uh, dictate almost what we could do. And it took about 18 months and then it was even worse getting it through our IRB. Uh, well, interestingly, the IRB, the, the lay people on the IRB were the most enthusiastic because they've all been touched by Alzheimer's and they know there's nothing available. We had a lot of uh, pushback from some of our clinical people you know, who were very wary about treating a, a diseased brain with, with radiation. But you know, eventually we persevered and I would say it took about eight years to get it through to the clinical trial. And now there, there's several around the world. It's been very, uh, uh, um, I'm not sure what word to use there, but we're very pleased that other people are taking it on as well. If I could just say one other thing, um, my conversations with pharma, they, they're often very worried about potential toxicities, particularly late toxicities. And, you know, for, for many years, we've been unable to give them reassurance based on our preclinical work. So relatively few people have been doing good quality studies, specifically addressing late toxicities. And I know that the mouse and rat models are not ideal for that, but at least if you can show some longer term studies that really monitor potential late toxicities um, and show that they're not worse or that they're manageable, then I think that's really important. And we haven't done that as a field um, until recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Christy, are we good to go now for Dr. Gua or is there a permanent 
problem. Yeah, unfortunately, it doesn't look like we're going to be able to get him on today. Um, so uh, apologies on behalf of Extra for that. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what's going on. Um, we'll make sure to send his slides as part of the, the presentation material afterward. And he, he is texting, he's chatting with me right now saying he definitely wants to be involved on the next round. So um, apologies for that. Okay, I also think we used up all our time, so you want to wrap it up or? John has yeah. a comment. John, John has a comment, right? John has a comment. Okay. John, go ahead. Unmute John. Where's John? <laughs> John, you have the last word. <laughs> but I don't see John. All right. He should he should be able to talk now. We've got a John, go ahead. <laughs> no, John. Can you hear me now? Ah, yes. yes. No, I've been muted. <laughs> okay. So it's a question that we asked some years ago, and that actually, whether different labs can reproduce other labs' results, because we seem to be doing a lot of interesting thing. Okay. Uh, I wonder whether there's any any uh, synergism or any uh, important finding by actually collaborating okay to study certain sites certain compounds so that's a general question to the audience anthony what do you think no oh, i've been pushing for this for a long time um so in the uk we have something called the radiotherapy drug combinations consortium and the whole point of that was to have network of labs who had different skills and different models and if you wanted to evaluate a new radiotherapy drug combination you could do it across different labs who would all contribute different parts of the jigsaw to get the package of data together and we've had a few successes and carl talked about one of them so the concord study is a really good example of that working um, we are trying to do it again uh, we're relaunching it in the UK at the moment, um, but those those have to include the normal tissue and so on. So it really makes sense to combine data from multiple labs. I absolutely agree with you. There are just some barriers in terms of who gets funded and how all that gets split up and who gets the credit, which we really have to try and move beyond. But I completely agree with you, John. Yeah. So I wonder whether we form a special interest group to uh, get the NIH and CI or even international funding because uh, uh, we have oh we do, we do experiments on humans and <laughs> time that we try to do on on, on the animals yeah there's there's definitely a need for that because as as most of you know eh, we sometimes organize conferences in this field so unfortunately not this year but maybe next year but there we often see that uh, people submit like very uh, similar abstracts, so it clearly means that uh, the people in our field are not collaborating enough. That's very clear. Each of these studies is, is very expensive, so there is definitely a bit of money that is not, let's say, 100% uh, efficiently used. So I think by yeah establishing some kind of consortium or so, that might be a very good idea. Well, again, thank you on behalf of Extral. Thank you for everyone joining today. Thank you so much to our speakers and to also Dr. Wong for his introductory comments and Dr. Verhagen for moderating. Uh, we will be sending out a recording of this event. And if you have any additional questions, please feel free to contact us directly and we will make sure to get those questions to the speakers. So again, thank, thank you for your attention and this concludes the session. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.